Today, I'll be counting down the top 10 toughest gym leaders across all of main series Pokemon. Now, obviously this is a very subjective topic, but I tried my best to build this list with a healthy mix of my own personal experiences and community input from you all. Number 10, Candice. Ice is not normally a very threatening type. While it's very offensively effective, it only resists itself while having four weaknesses. Most ice type gym leaders, such as Wolfric or Price, don't tend to be very tricky to defeat. Candice is a different story. This is her team in Diamond and Pearl, and it's very similar in the remakes. The three actual ice types aren't much of a problem since they have four times weaknesses and Infernape can deal with by itself. But the Metacham can be tricky with pure power doubling its attack, and if you let it set up some bulk ups, you could have some serious issues. But what got me to put Candice on this list is not her Diamond and Pearl team or her BDSP team, which is the same Pokemon, but with better move sets and items. It's her Platinum team which is the version of her I have fought by far the most times because Platinum is by far the best version of Sinnoh. First, Sneasel and Abomasnow were made better. Sneasel gets priority Ice Shard instead of negative priority Avalanche, which was very stupid for a frail Pokemon to have in the first place. Abomasnow gets Water Pulse coverage for its Fire weakness, as well as Focus Blast coverage for its Steel weakness. Metacham is gone, but it's replaced by Piloswine, a solid Pokemon that can counter your Fire type hard if you don't one-shot it. But those Pokemon are paltry compared to her new ace, Frostlass. The first problem is its ability Snow Cloak, which makes it so moves used on Frostlass when it's hailing have their accuracy cut by a fifth. Her Frostlass cannot set up hail itself, but a bomb of snow guarantees it with its ability Snow Warning. And in Gen 4, the weather causing abilities create permanent weather. If you don't have a way to change the weather yourself and the Obama Snow doesn't enter into battle when hail's already been set up by Piloswine, then that hail's gonna be there for the rest of the battle. This permanent hail not only chips away at your Pokemon and makes Frostlass harder to hit, but it makes its powerful Blizzard always hit. Then as an insult to injury, Frostlass has Double Team, a move that I believe should be removed from the game alongside Minimize because it's such scummy garbage. Double Team boosts its evasion in addition to the Snow Cloak boost, meaning if it's hailing and Frostlass has used just one Double Team, a 100% accurate move will only hit 60% of the time. If it's two Double Teams, it's down to 48%. I make a lot of jokes about how if a move isn't 100% accurate, it's 50% accurate. When you're fighting this Frostlass, if a move is 100% accurate, it's 50% accurate. Even if you get a very specially bulky Pokemon to tank hits while you hope to land some, Frostlass's Shadow Ball and Psychic have significant chances to lower your special defense. Because of my age and the fact that I've been playing Pokemon for over 20 years, it's pretty rare that I will lose a gym battle in a regular playthrough so no like specific gimmick or challenge or team limitation. However, in my Can You Beat Pokemon Platinum video from a few years ago, I was swept by Candace's Frostlass. Although to be fair, that was a brutally difficult playthrough challenge. Number nine, Tate and Liza, but just in Emerald. First, I have to mention that any gym battles that are double battles are by nature more difficult than they would be if they were single battles. The first reason is that switch battle style where the game says they're about to send out this Pokemon, do you want to switch, is not available, even for players choosing to play with it. Switch is easier than set and double battles force you into set. However, double battles are also tougher because your team isn't built for them. Protect is amazing in double battles, but has few applications in singles. So why would your team know it? Moves like Earthquake, Discharge, and Surf are awesome in singles, but they hurt your partner in doubles. Singles focused Pokemon often don't work as well in double battles, but you're fighting with a team of Pokemon made for single battles because that's all you've done up to this point. But despite that, I was still hesitant to include Tate and Liza in this list because in Ruby and Sapphire and their remakes, I think they're really easy. Just fire off some surfs or grass moves and their two, only two Pokemon go down easy. Plus counterintuitively, this fight can actually be easier because it's a double battle because they only have two Pokemon. That means you can make it a 2v1 situation 
very quickly. But enough people responded to this tweet of mine mentioning Tate and Liza in Emerald that I felt they deserved a spot. And it's not just you all, I thought about it some more and I definitely agree. Their Emerald team specifically is ferocious. The most obvious change is the addition of two Pokemon, Claydol and Zatu, and that is massive. Doubling the number of Pokemon makes it much tougher to get it down to a 2v1 situation. But even so, the new Pokemon still work really synergistically. Claydol can fire off earthquakes for free since Solrock and Lunatone have Levitate and Zatu is flying type, meaning it can never hurt its partner. Light Screen boosts the special defense of both itself and its partner, lowering the usefulness of all your grass and water moves. Psychic is good stab with the special defense drop chance, and of course, if it gets an Ancient Power Omni boost, God help you. Zatu almost always starts by setting up Calm Mind, a terrifying move that not only makes it hit harder, but also makes it harder to KO with Dark, Electric, or Ice moves, the latter two of which Claydol has super effective moves for. Confuse Ray is a nuisance, and Sunny Day can help set up for Soul Rock. Soul Rock has poor special attack, but if it gets the sun set up, either doing so itself or from Zatu, Flamethrower and Solar Beam become huge problems for the grass and water Pokemon that would normally wreck Soul Rock. Finally, Lunatone just hits pretty hard, can do some scary Calm Minds, boost itself and its partner with Light Screen, and put you to sleep because of course it can. Well-designed double battles can be some of the toughest fights in all of Pokemon, and Tate and Liza are a prime example of that. Number eight, Lenora. When I made my toughest gym leader in every game video a few years ago, I determined those gym leaders by narrowing down a game's gym leaders to just two to four, and then pulling you all on my community tab. And then whichever one won was the hardest gym leader for that video. When I did the poll for black and white, I was expecting Lenora to win, but a different one won instead. To honor that outcome, that gym leader will be in this video, but I had to include Lenora in this list because for several years, I despised Watchog because of her. Well, and also Team Plasma, but like, Mostly her. The first piece of her difficulty is that she's a normal type specialist, which is often a deceptively difficult type to deal with. It cannot deal super effective damage, but only two types resist it, steel and rock, and then of course ghost is immune. Fighting, the only type normal is weak to, does not resist normal. So if your fighting type can't deal the big damage it needs to quickly, it's going to take an unresisted hit. So all normal specialist battles can be challenging because your counter options are so limited but Lenora is so early, the second gym leader, that it limits your counter options even further. At that point in the game, assuming you don't level any of your Pokemon past level 20, which is what her Watchog is, your counter options are Rog and Rolla for Rock type, which is very weak, nothing for Steel and Ghost, and then Pignite if you picked it, Timber, Sock, and Throw for fighting. Pignite's arm thrust is unreliable and Timber is pretty weak. Sock and Throw are frankly very good for this fight, but if you need specific Pokemon to make a fight easy, then the fight isn't easy. She leads off the battle with Herdier. While not the biggest threat, Intimidate means your physical fighting type either has to go in with lower attack or be brought back in later or not used at all. It's not a huge problem, but it's not a pushover. Her Watchog is the true threat. It has Retaliate, a 70 base power move that's Stab, but it doubles to 140 if used the turn after a teammate faints. So Herdier goes down, then Watchog's base 85 attack, high for this early in the game, nukes one of your Pokemon with Retaliate, a move that, as I covered, cannot be resisted by any Pokemon except Rog and Rolla or a wildly overleveled Excadrill. Leer and Crunch can lower your defense, so Retaliate hits hard even after the initial nuke, but also Hypnosis is just awful. Whether it hits and how long you sleep is up to luck. Like with Candice's Frostlass, if it's already a tough battle to begin with, but then luck becomes a central major determining factor, that can and will be the difference between whether you win or lose. As I mentioned, Sock and Throw, they're really good for this fight, but if you don't wanna use them, this fight can be freaking brutal. Haha! -ha, it's just I, good run tip, bye! And dude, I need your help. Mother's Day is coming up soon, and I don't know what to get my mom! Wait, what? How could you possibly not know? Obviously, you get her the everyday earbuds from Raycon, the sponsor of today's video. With audio quality rivaling far more expensive brands, they're my go-to gift for anyone. Right, 
But eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life are incredible. And with the easy to use earbud tap functions, I can pause or go to the next song without fumbling for my phone. Also being able to swap between noise isolation and awareness mode is great depending on where I'm listening. I am aware, however, I just can't understand how you couldn't have thought of this. My mom and I use our Raycons to talk on the phone with each other all the time, especially on walks, letting us keep in touch even though we're not in the same city. They're perfect for a Mother's Day gift, and I just cannot fathom how you didn't think of Raycons. Because I got them for her last year! She loves them! I don't know how I'm gonna top it! Oh. Okay, that, that makes more sense. Um, well, if our lovely viewers didn't do that, they can get 20% off their Raycon purchase, plus free shipping at buyraycon.com slash mnjtv, linked in the description below. <laughs> Great, you've helped all of them, but now what about me? Um, coupon book for free hugs? Are you serious? I, why did I even come here? Ta-ta! Number seven, Elisa. Elisa was the toughest gym leader in Unova as voted by you all several years ago. And the main reason for that is her stupid Emolgas. Electric only has one weakness and it's to ground, but Emolga is immune to ground thanks to being flying, instead only being weak to rock and ice. Ice moves are extremely difficult to come by at this point in the game, so really your only super effective option for Emolga is rock. Now, if these Emolga had electric attacks like spark or shockwave, they wouldn't be too bad. However, they, along with her Zeb Stryka, have Volt Switch, which allows them to hit you, then switch out so your attack hits something else. Go for a rock move on Emolga, it Volt Switches first, then brings in Zeb Stryka, who is not weak to rock. Go for a ground move on Zeb Stryka, Volt Switch into Emolga, and no damage happens. It then becomes a game of prediction, which at times can be trickier with an NPC gym leader than it is with a real person because sometimes the gym leaders don't go for the most optimal play randomly. And you're like, I thought you were gonna Volt Switch there and you didn't, what the hell? Now, of course you can stop the Volt Switches using a ground type, but you won't hit very hard with rock moves since no rock ground types are available in a black white Unova playthrough. Additionally, a ground type will not resist Emolga's aerial aces, another stab attack that's nothing to scoff at. Her black two, white two team is easier with one Emolga becoming a less threatening Flaffy and the other losing Aerial Ace. But that should tell you something. Elisa was such a problem in black and white that they had to nerf her in the sequel. Number six, Raihan. Remember how I said that double battle gym battles are trickier than singles because your team isn't built for it? And I also talked about how the synergistic construction of Tate and Liza's Emerald team makes them exceptionally challenging. Well, what if there was another double battle gym battle that was the last one. And so it went even harder with synergistic double battle strategies. There is, and it's Raihan. Raihan has a Sandstorm team that is not as well built as a competitive player's, but it's a darn good team. He leads with Flygon and Sandstream Gigalith, instantly setting up a Sandstorm that will chip away at most of your Pokemon and none of his, while also boosting the special defense of Gigalith. A water type won't like Flygon's Thunder Punch, and an ice type would decimate Flygon but it has Steel Wing and Gigalith has Body Press, which can do massive damage due to Gigalith's base 130 defense. Flygon also has Breaking Swipe, a move that hits both of your Pokemon and is guaranteed to lower their physical attack, making it even harder to get good damage out with any non-fairy physical attackers. Now his Gigalith is not holding a Smooth Rock, which extends the duration of Summoned Sandstorm from five to eight turns. So you might be thinking, oh, I could just stall the Sandstorm out. No. He's gonna bring it back. At some point, he will send in Sandaconda with its ability Sand Spit, summoning a sandstorm when it takes a hit, and it can do so multiple times if it gets to that point. Its Earth Power and Fire Fang won't do too much damage, but it can be a nuisance in other ways by paralyzing your Pokemon with Glare or simply negating your attack by protecting. Finally, Gigantamax Duraludon, a steel dragon type with only two weaknesses, fighting and ground. Yeah, if your first time fighting this, you were like me and you're like, I'm gonna just bring a fairy type. I'm gonna wreck this dragon gym. Uh, uh, you won't, you don't. Uh, you can only deal with Flygon and that has freaking Steel Wing. 
Fighting and ground moves are normally physical, which means that they have to get through Duraludon's high defense, but your attack might have been dropped by Flygon's breaking swipe. Duraludon's max move set is nasty too. G-Max Depletion can cut away at your precious PP, Max Rockfall can set up Sandstorm again, Max Steel Spike can make both enemies even harder to KO with physical moves by boosting their defense, and Max Knuckle boosts Duraludon and its allies' attack even further. If you're not careful, Raihan can boost his Pokemon to a point of no return. And remember, assuming you don't bring a weather-changing power of your own, you're gonna be taking Sandstorm chip damage on all of your non-Rock Ground Steel Pokemon most, if not all, of the battle. If you don't come out of the gate swinging hard with big hits, you could definitely lose. Now that we've reached the halfway point, I would like to quickly ask you a favor. Uh, check if you're subscribed. A lot of my viewers are not subscribed, and I think that's because a lot of you think you're subscribed, because YouTube's algorithm is pretty good at showing you when I have a new video that's out. So if you're a fan of mine, you've watched this far into the video, and you're not subscribed, I'd really appreciate it, it helps me out. So just check if you are, pretty please. Number five, Fantina. This is an aside, but every time I think about Fantina, I think about this clip from my Team Sky Platinum playthrough. Hello, Fantina. You are standing in the way of Team Sky's glorious victory. So you and your opulent dress must fall. No, wait, no, that sounds like a, no, wait, hold on. Ghost is not an easy type to deal with. It has two immunities, more than any other type, and only two weaknesses. However, one of those weaknesses is itself, meaning using Ghost against Ghost is very risky. Without a Dark type, it can be tough to deal with any Ghost specialist. Fantina is exceptional, though, thanks to how strong her Pokemon are. In Diamond and Pearl, when she's the fifth gym leader, all three of her Pokemon are high based at total Pokemon. Driftblim is super tanky and can infuriatingly boost its evasion with Minimize. Plus, an ominous wind omni boost is always possible. Gengar uses its inferior physical attack, thankfully, because it would be absolutely brutal if it used its special attack, like Miss Magius does. Hitting fast and hard with special attack that's over 100, Miss Magius can output severe damage. But then we go to Platinum, where Fantina changes from being the fifth gym leader to the third and that makes her a lot more difficult. While Driftblim and Gengar are replaced by weaker Pokemon, Miss Magius remains the same. This is terrifying, since at this point in the game, you'll have fewer team options and less evolved Pokemon to deal with a powerful base 495 stat total Pokemon. And don't discount the others. Duskull's Will-O-Wisp Burns can ruin your hopes to use Bite or Crunch, and Haunter's Confuse Ray and Hypnosis can wreak havoc and turn the battle south if your luck is bad. And then there's her BDSP team, which is weird. Driftblim and Gengar get better, but then Miss Magius loses Shadow Ball in favor of having a much weaker Phantom Force? I don't get it. Platinum is overall still the toughest version of her though, and that matters the most because that is the de facto version of Sinnoh. Number four, Norman. Norman is the only gym leader to have a Pokemon with a base stat total that's the same as Groudon. And he's got two of them. In Ruby and Sapphire, your dad has two Slackings, an insanely powerful Pokemon with a base stat total of 670. It has monstrous 160 attack, so its offense is preposterous, but it's also super bulky. 150 HP is huge, and it's helped further by its 100 defense. Its 65 special defense is poor, but remember, normal's only weak to fighting. This is Gen 3. All fighting moves are physical which means it is impossible to do super effective damage against the slacking against its weaker special defense stat. One slacking can put you to sleep while the other can heal itself even after Norman runs out of hyper potions. The stronger one also has focus punch, which can obliterate your normal resisting rock and steel types if you misplay. If you've never done this fight before, you might be thinking, oh, I'll just like cripple the slacking by giving it burn, paralysis, or poison, you know? <laughs> and that would be a really bad idea. Both slacking have Facade, a move that doubles in power from 70 to 140 if the Pokemon has one of those status conditions. In Gen 3, Burn still has its attack, so it will stay effectively 70 power, but in short, I do not suggest trying to whittle it down with poison or slow it down with paralysis. It could absolutely wipe your team before the poison even has a chance to kill it. Additionally, the point at which this fight occurs adds to its difficulty. 
It is immediately after fighting Flannery, yet his ace is three levels higher than hers. The only new trainers you get access to between the fights are the optional desert trainers and Norman's gym trainers. You might gain some levels, but three levels for a whole team is not likely. Plus, again, Slacking has a base stat total of 670. At around level 30, you're not even gonna have a fully evolved starter, which means a lot of your other team are not gonna be fully evolved. It's a severe base stat total mismatch. Now, of course, um, I have so far neglected to mention that the Slack Kings have Truant. Um, really, really terrible ability makes it so they only attack every other turn. So that, that makes them not as fearsome as I may have presented them to be so far. But that's freaking necessary. Truant takes this fight from impossible to just difficult. In Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, his team is similar, albeit his main move is Retaliate instead of Facade, which is both better and worse. You can freely status condition the Pokemon now, but two of his three Pokemon get a free 140 power nuke on you the turn after you KO another Pokemon. In Emerald, he's down to only one Slacking, and I do think that overall makes this battle easier than in the other games. You have to be careful though, because Belly Drum Linoon can single-handedly lose you this battle. It maxes its attack, he hyper potions up any health it lost, then with its high base 100 speed, it can absolutely sweep your entire team. I uh, unfortunately speak from experience. <coughs> Scared of the freaking Slack Kings and the Linoon swept me, come on. Number three, Claire. Dragon type specialists tend to be more threatening before the introduction of the fairy type. Claire only exists in games before fairy, and her dragons don't have dual types that you can exploit. In the case of Kingdra, its dual type makes things worse. In Gen 2, she has three Dragonairs, all of which leap at the chance to ruin your day with paralysis. Being pure dragon types, they're only weak to dragon, which is not only risky, but almost impossible to obtain yourself, and ice, which is more accessible, but still not easy. There are also just very few good ice types in Gen 2. There's like Lapras. Uh, water type Pokemon often get ice coverage, but one of the Dragonairs has Thunderbolt, and you won't know which one until it's too late. But then she brings in Kingdra, whose water type cancels out its ice weakness, meaning it's only weak to Dragon, which as I said, you very likely do not have. You can get like a level 10 Dratini near town, and then you might have a Kingdra yourself. Like, that's it. Kingdra also has a base stat total of 540, meaning it's a very strong Pokemon with effectively no weaknesses. Tack on the annoyance of Smokescreen, and this thing is difficult to kill. Plus, even if you try to status it to stop it, it's late enough into the game that Claire uses full heals and full restores, not just potions. And then you go to HeartGold SoulSilver, which gives the player some benefits, like the Red Gyarados and Feraligator get Ice Fang, which is really helpful, but Claire also gets tougher. One Dragonair is gone, replaced by Gyarados, which is easy to dispatch if you have an electric move and a terrifying threat if you don't. The Dragonairs have better move sets, still with Thunder Wave, of course, but then Kingdra has been significantly buffed. A Citrus Berry heals it, its Dragon Breath is now the stronger Dragon Pulse, and instead of Surf, it has Hydro Pump, which can miss, but if it doesn't, it is nuking anything that doesn't resist it. Plus, Johto has some weird level curves, so you might be underleveled going into the fight, which makes it even more impressive if you can pull out the win. And thus makes it even more frustrating when she doesn't give you the freaking badge, you baby! That was, just give me the damn badge, do your job, woman! Number two, Sabrina. A common thread you may have caught on to in this video is that most gym leaders that are very difficult specialize in a type that has very few weaknesses. And a lot of times, one of those weaknesses is to itself, which makes it risky. Normal is only weak to fighting. Electric is only weak to ground. Ghost is only weak to itself and dark. And Dragon, before Gen 6, is only weak to ice and itself. But Sabrina is the first gym leader on this list where most of her team has no weaknesses. I'll try to keep my explanation for why the psychic type was overpowered in Gen 1 as brief as I can, because I've talked about it several times and so have other creators, but it basically boils down to four main reasons. Number one, special attack and special defense were one stat, meaning psychic type Pokemon excelled in both. Number two, the only type to resist psychic 
was psychic. Number three, poison types were everywhere. And four, Psychic had no real weaknesses. The Dark type did not exist. Due to a glitch, Psychic was immune to Ghost instead of weak to it. And the only bug type attacks were Leech Life, Pin Missile, and Twin Needle, which are not only terribly weak, but also learned by almost no Pokemon. The only Pokemon to get Twin Needle is freaking Beedrill, which is not only just a weak Pokemon in general, but also, it's poison type and weak to psychic. So of course a specialist in an overpowered type is gonna be a tough gym leader to deal with no matter what. But in all the gen one games, she uses Alakazam, the best non Mewtwo psychic type in the game. It is insanely fast and hits like a truck on the special side, even more so in yellow due to using psychic instead of Psybeam. And as I mentioned, the only type to resist its psychic attacks is another psychic Pokemon. If you don't come prepared with a strong physical attacker to take advantage of Alakazam's low physical defense, and it has to be one that's fast like Tauros or takes hits well like Snorlax, you could absolutely just get wrecked. By Gen 3, Psychic had been nerfed by the addition of the Dark type, it being weak to Ghost, and decent bug moves becoming at least somewhat available. However, in Kanto specifically, it's still the best type in the game. There are dark type moves like Bite or Feign Attack, but no dark type Pokemon in Kanto. The only ghost type is Gengar, who is weak to Psychic, and in Gen 3 uses its poor physical attack for its ghost moves. And the only decent bug Pokemon, Scyther and Pinsir, still get screwed with bug type moves. Scyther doesn't get Fury Cutter until 46 above when you'd fight Sabrina, and Pinsir doesn't get any bug moves at all. Sometimes I think like, wow, the jump from Gen 2 to 3 might be the biggest between generations jump in all of Pokemon. Like the graphics, the addition of abilities and natures and just so much was added. And then I look at some Pokemon's level up move sets and they like don't get any stab moves. And I'm like, were they brain dead? And even though now you have the option to crunch your way to success, I still think her fire red leaf green team is the strongest version of Sabrina because of the move Calm Mind. With just one Calm Mind, Alakazam now hits 50% harder with the best Psychic move, Psychic, and it now takes less damage from Dark moves, which are all special in Gen 3. If you misplay and let it get too boosted, it can absolutely sweep you. Sabrina is extremely fearsome and can hand you a bad loss if you don't go in prepared. At least up until Let's Go where they made her stink. Alakazam now only knows Psychic and Nightshade? They made it worse in the only Kanto game where you can actually get dark types? I just, what, what is this, a game for babies? Well, actually, now that I say it out loud, of all the mainline Pokemon games, I would say Let's Go is the closest one to a game for babies. Sabrina's not as threatening as a post-game leader in the Johto games because by that point, you have a fully decked out team that likely overlevels her and could actually have a dark type. But in Gen 1 and Gen 3, be careful. Before I reveal number one, I have some quick honorable mentions. Drayden and Iris have Dragon Dance Haxoruses. Haxorai? Haxoropodes? <laughs> Haxoropodes not. Which would be super terrifying if their main dragon move was not the decreased priority Dragon Tail. If that's instead Dragon Claw or even Dual Chop, they're on this list. Juan's Kingdra is much like Claire's, strong and only weak to Dragon, but it can also rest Chestoberry and use Double Team, a nasty strategy for a hard to one-shot Pokemon. However, his other four Pokemon are total pushovers. Finally, Iono's Levitate Terra Electric Miss Magius is actually a Pokemon with truly no weaknesses. Charge Beam can also snowball, boosting its special attack with each use. However, none of her Pokemon have four moves, so aside from Belly Bolt, maybe with Water Gun coverage on ground, her team overall is not too difficult to deal with. Although if Hermes Magius or any of her Pokemon had Thunder Wave and then paired that with Hex, then she might've gotten onto this list. But now, at long last, number one, Whitney. I know, I know, it's pretty predictable and basic to choose Whitney here. Whitney and her mill tank are very infamous, uh, but they are infamous for a reason. Whitney is the hardest gym leader in all of Pokemon and I will die on this hill. I don't care if you are one of those people who's never had problems with Whitney. I and millions of other people definitely have. 
Both of her teams feature Clefairy and Miltank, but Clefairy is rarely hard to deal with. Unless, of course, it gets really lucky with something insane from Metronome. Miltank is the entire problem. First off, it has a base stat total of 490, which is absolutely massive for a level 19 or 20 Pokemon. There are exceedingly few Pokemon you can obtain that early in the game that have a base stat total that gets even close to Miltank's, much less exceeds it. Chances are very high that most of your team will be significantly weaker than Miltank. Miltank has 80 base attack. Okay overall, but quite good this early. It is also preposterously fast. Yeah, Miltank is faster than Arcanine. You know, the majestic legendary dog that runs agilely as if on wings and can cross 6,200 miles in one single day and night. Is the cow just rolling faster? I don't even, what? It also has very solid bulk, especially physically, which matters more since most fighting moves, all of them in Gen 2, are physical. There are extremely few scenarios where you can knock it out in one hit. Most of the time you have to whittle it down slowly, which fails because not only can Whitney potion, but once she's out of those, Miltank can still use Milk Drink 10 times. She can heal up 10 times without using a potion. Do you know when they dropped Milk Drink's PP down to five? Gen 9, Scarlet and Violet, that is over two decades too late. As for her other moves, Stomp and Attract can make it so you just don't move at all. Attract infatuates your male Pokemon, and I should add that your starter has an 87.5% chance to be male, so you won't move half the time. Then Stomp has a 30% chance to flinch if Miltank goes first, which it likely will due to its illogical 100 base speed stat. If you have an infatuated Pokemon that is outsped by Miltank and hit by Stomp and not killed, the chances of that Pokemon getting to do anything are 35%. 35% are you kidding? And I haven't even covered rollout. Rollout snowballs, or should I say rock balls? No, no, that sounds weird. Uh, it, it doubles in power every turn, eventually reaching powers of 160 and 320 on the fourth and fifth hits. If it gets to that point, resistances mean nothing. You just have to pray it misses. Her gen four mill tank is one level lower than her gen two one, but it received two buffs in exchange. The first is the ability Scrappy, allowing it to hit ghost types with normal moves. So if you wanted to cheese your way through this battle with a Ghastly, uh, you can't. Additionally, it now holds a Lumberry, which can one time heal any status condition that you give it, like Paralysis to slow it down, Poison to whittle it away, or Burn to half its offense. That is an insanely good item to give a Pokemon that is under level 20. Now, obviously, there are ways around Whitney. If there were not, the game would not be beatable. Onyx does well tanking the hits since it resists all her moves and has high defense. The in-game trade Muscle the Machop does well because it's a female and can't be attracted and is also a fighting type. But even with that Machop, it still fainted during my only Gen 2 battle with her. So yes, there are available counters, but that further proves her difficulty. Most gym battles can be won by simply waltzing in with whatever your playthrough team is, whatever you want it to be, and using the Pokemon that are super effective against that gym leader. If you don't get these specific counters, Whitney's battle is absolutely insane. And if a battle is near insurmountable without specifically designed counters, then it's an extremely hard battle. If Whitney was a later gym leader, she likely would not top this list because you would have better Pokemon to fight her. But with such a strong Pokemon that early, it makes her the toughest gym leader in all of Pokemon and makes her my least favorite and also Miltank, my least favorite Pokemon. And also her and Claire both, the two strongest gym leaders in Johto, throw tantrums when you beat them. Whitney cries? What about my tears, Whitney, huh? Thank you so much for watching, really appreciate it. Uh, there's a video on screen uh, that YouTube thinks that you will specifically like, um, and they're pretty good at recommending stuff, actually, so you should check it out. Um, subscribe if you haven't, and that's all I have for now. So until next time, big fans, gotta catch them all.